Should we dig up and display human remains, or maybe never bury them at all? If so, then under what circumstances is it permissible and why? If it's okay to put Egyptian mummies and bog men in glass cases in museums, then why not you or your granny? If it's never all right, then why not? In this video from History Calling, we look at the ways in which human remains are displayed both in modern times and historically, and the arguments for and against the practice. I'll be talking to you about the treatment of some very famous dead people, including Pharaoh Tutankhamun of Egypt, Kings Henry VI and Richard III of England, Thomas and Oliver Cromwell, you're getting a two-for-one there, Vladimir Lenin of Russia, and the so-called Miracle of Missouri case from 2023, regarding a dead nun who was disinterred after four years in the ground and promptly put on display for an incredible reason which I'll be telling you about later in the video. We'll think too about the anonymous dead, who may be hanging out in a museum or exhibition centre near you, including Irish bog bodies, criminals and people used in medical research. I'm also running a poll over on my community tab in tandem with this week's release to see what you think about the display of the dead, so make sure you check that out and cast your vote. Let's start by thinking about the locations and ways in which human remains are and have been displayed. As this is a history channel, I'm going to focus mostly on how historical remains are shown and how remains have been shown historically. However, I'll just briefly touch on what is done for the recently deceased in modern times to give you some context. In these cases, and I'm thinking about Western societies here because that's what I'm used to, but it might differ elsewhere in the world. The body may well be put in an open coffin in either a funeral parlour or the person's home. You might also have an open coffin in the church or other location you're hosting the funeral in during the service. The deceased is only on display for a short amount of time, however, and the idea is that only family and friends will see them. This practice dates back centuries, if not millennia, as you can see from these historical examples, and might even occur next to the graveside, as indicated by this old image of a Russian burial. In fact, it is so pervasive that it has even made its way into children's stories. Think of Snow White in her glass coffin, for instance. On a grander scale, it is done for well-known individuals, often in much larger locations, and is known as lying in state. You might remember that Queen Elizabeth II lay here in Westminster Hall in London, for instance. She was in a closed coffin, but in some areas of the world, open coffins are preferred, and historically this was often the case too. Here is the lying in state of Pope Pius IX, for instance, who died in 1878, or Willem IV, Prince of Orange Nassau, who passed away in 1751, and Oliver Cromwell, who took over the ruling of the British Isles as protector after the abolition of the monarchy and died in 1658. More on the wacky journey his remains went on in a few minutes. In centuries gone by, dead bodies, or parts of them, might also be displayed in some public outdoor place, but not just in the minutes before burial. An example of this is the now defunct practice of placing the heads of traitors on spikes on London Bridge, as you see in this old drawing. In England, this was done to many famous individuals, such as Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Moore, both ministers to Henry VIII. But placing heads on spikes happened in other parts of the country too, not just London. Richard Duke of York, father of Edward IV, suffered this indignity after his death in December 1460, for instance, when his head was displayed in the city of York. Other instances of the public show of bodies for degradation purposes would be when people, usually black people, were lynched in the American South and elsewhere in the world, or the exposure of the body of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini alongside that of his mistress and other associates after they were executed in 1945. Thankfully, this repugnant activity no longer happens in most societies, but it does still occur in some parts of the world. For those who have been deceased for so long, usually centuries at least, that they are considered historical, the most common place to see them nowadays is in a museum, usually in some sort of clear display case. This is where most, if not all of us, will have seen Egyptian mummies, bodies preserved in bogs, and less well-known individuals who are nevertheless considered to be of interest. 
This might be because of something they did during their lifetime, because of some perceived abnormality in their anatomy, or because of their age. These remains can be full corpses in various stages of desiccation or decomposition, or skeletons. Less commonly, you might see human remains in churches, archives, catacombs, a mausoleum, the occasional library, or even, for lack of a better term, display centres that are used for other things too. This image, for instance, shows hundreds, maybe thousands of remains on display in the Capuchin tombs of Palermo in Sicily. Although I'm showing you historical pictures of this location, that's just to stay on the sweet side of YouTube's guidelines, which don't like photos or footage of the deceased. These catacombs still exist today, and you can visit them, where you'll see these remains, and all the others that have been acquired since this drawing was made, dressed in their best clothes and strung up on the walls. I'll leave a link to modern pictures and video footage of them below. Another example is the 2023 case I mentioned in the intro, in which a nun from Missouri, who died in 2019, was disinterred from her grave in order to move her to another resting place in her former church. She actually founded this religious order in 1995. For reasons which we'll come to when I'm discussing motives for display, instead of being reburied, she was put on show in the church and was not even initially in any protective casing. I can't show you any photos of her due to copyright restrictions, but again, I will leave a link to a couple of articles about the story in the description box below. Elsewhere, we have the remains of former Russian leader Vladimir Lenin, who died in 1924, and is on display in a mausoleum outside the Kremlin, and the skeleton of a so-called Irish giant, which was available for viewing in the Hunterian Museum in London for centuries. There is also a travelling exhibition called Body Worlds, in which real, modern human remains are preserved using a process called plastinization, and, with the skin mostly removed so that the internal structure can be seen, are presented in all sorts of poses. So those are the main ways in which human remains are and have been publicly displayed in some different areas around the world, though I'm sure I've missed some and I invite you to share the customs of other countries and cultures in the comments below. Now let's think about the motives behind these displays, and whether they hold up to scrutiny. Laying out the dead in their home, a funeral parlour, or a church or other building in which a funeral service is about to be held for them, is done to allow family and friends to pay their final respects and say goodbye to the individual. The idea behind the similar practice of lying in state is usually that more than just the immediate family and friends will be able to see the body and pay their respects, and we saw that in 2022 when Queen Elizabeth died and many thousands of people were able to file past her coffin. In such cases, one could argue that even if the deceased didn't give explicit permission for their bodies to be displayed like this, it is or was such an established part of their culture that they can reasonably be expected to have known that this would likely happen to their own remains and, by virtue of their not leaving clear instructions asking that it not be done to them, accepted it and gave tacit permission. In other words, if you're living in a country, like Northern Ireland, where I'm from, where it is common practice to show the dead in their homes or a funeral parlour, you know it will likely happen to you as long as your remains are deemed to be in a fit condition for display, and by not asking for anything different, you're essentially saying you're fine with it. Popes and royalty also know that it was and is the done thing for them to lie in state after their deaths, so if they don't specify that they want something else, then the argument goes they have also de facto agreed to this scenario. In a few cases, the display of the remains of prominent people was done to prove that they were dead. This was the case for Henry VI and Richard III of England, so that no one would try to restore them to the throne, for the first died under very suspicious circumstances in the Tower of London in 1471, I have a video on that topic actually which I'll leave linked for you, and the second at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. These displays didn't last long, however, and they were afterwards given church burials. An unusual cause of death might also result in a display, as in the case of this skull shown in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, which has very obvious trauma and was probably murdered. Before we carry on, if you're enjoying this content, please remember to give this video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you approve, as this really helps the channel out and hit the subscribe button with the notification bell switched on so you get a reminder when I upload. 
You can also find me on Instagram, where I post at least once a week, and on Patreon, where I provide bonus material including mini podcasts and early access to ad-free videos. Thank you as always to those of you who are already my patrons, and to those who support the channel by making one-off donations using the thanks button beneath videos. In other cases, bodies or body parts were displayed to degrade or further punish the deceased and possibly deter crime. This is why heads of execution victims were stuck on spikes on London Bridge and why Mussolini and his associates and lynching victims were left out in the open. Criminals who otherwise had no claim to fame were sometimes dissected, reduced to their skeletons and displayed as well, as in the case of English murderer Elizabeth Brownrigg, who was executed in 1767 for murdering her 14-year-old servant girl. This practice, which continued for many years, was partly influenced by the now thoroughly debunked pseudoscience of phrenology, which held that a person's personality could be determined by things like the shape of their skull. We also see an instance of a punishment display with Richard III, as he was initially stripped naked and slung over the back of a horse in order to be removed from the battlefield. Injuries found on his skeleton after its rediscovery in 2012 suggested post-mortem humiliation wounds had been inflicted upon him too. As for Oliver Cromwell, while the first display of his body was meant to honour him, the second was certainly not. When Charles II retook the throne in 1660, he had Cromwell and the other deceased regicides, who were responsible for the execution of his father, Charles I, exhumed and hung in chains. The former protector's head ended up on a spike on London Bridge, where it stayed for decades, until it blew down in a storm. It still exists today, having been salvaged and kept as a curiosity for centuries, but it has been reburied in a secret location which only a handful of people know about. Another motivation often cited in the modern display of historical remains is the educational benefit it supposedly provides to onlookers. This is the reason you will usually hear or read about in the cases of Egyptian mummies like Tutankhamun, as well as bog bodies and other historical remains. The idea is that by looking at the remains, you are remembering history and learning about other cultures and or time periods. Thus, there are usually information boards around the remains explaining their historical context, possibly other artefacts from the same time and place to add more context to the individual's life and death, and perhaps video reconstructions, audio recordings, and or imagined images of them during life, or which explain how the remains were found and came to be in their current location. Particularly famous individuals like Tutankhamun are presumably more likely to attract visitors, and so further the educational mission of the exhibit. In the case of Richard III, whose skeleton was displayed via a TV show about the discovery of his remains and through photographs made available online, the knowledge gained centred around his mode of death, the confirmation of long-held rumours that he suffered from scoliosis, and an analysis of his DNA which revealed details about his diet and lifestyle. When the display isn't explaining the history of that person or that culture, the value is often said to lie in what it can tell us about the human condition. This display in Edinburgh, which is actually mostly casts, demonstrates human evolution, for instance, while the Body World's exhibition is intended to centre around health and understanding the human body to promote preventative health care, so you can, for example, see the lungs of a smoker next to the lungs of a non-smoker in order to appreciate the damage that smoking causes. In the case of Irishman Charles Byrne, who died in 1783, his skeleton was put on display in the Hunterian Museum in London for two centuries because he was exceptionally tall, being 7 feet 6 inches in height at the time of his death. You can see the manner in which he was shown here, and the argument for this was that it allowed medical students to learn from the disease he had, which caused his exceptional growth, and the general public to see the devastating effects of it. Other similar cases have happened elsewhere. Here you see a so-called giant and dwarf next to each other in order to emphasise the difference in their size, and until recent years the skeleton of another exceptionally tall Irishman, Cornelius McGrath, was on display in the Long Library at Trinity College Dublin. Do assertions of educational value hold water though? It's true you might learn about mummies, bog bodies and the causes and effects of excessive or limited growth in humans 
from visiting one of these exhibitions. But do the actual remains need to be there for that? After all, all the necessary information can now be provided through facial or full body reconstructions, such as the one you see here, as well as audio-visual material and the written word. If you think I'm wrong, consider this. Displays of dinosaur bones in museums, including this one in the American Natural History Museum in New York City, frequently show only replicas. The real bones are presumably considered too fragile and precious to be on display, but based on my own observations of how busy the museum was the day I visited, it doesn't seem to deter people from coming to the exhibit. Might not the same be true for human displays? As for the analysis of the remains, this can be done privately and doesn't take forever. Richard III was only disinterred for two and a half years, after which he was reburied, the study of his remains complete. Do we really have anything left to learn from a bog person, mummy, or so-called giant who has been studied for centuries that requires the body to remain on display? Nowadays we can take tiny samples to hold on file, make 3D scans and models, and take x-rays, MRIs, photographs and footage of the corpse or bones. Why do we need to hold on to the remains for so long? Some will argue that there's nothing as good as the real thing, and that it's more likely to attract visitors. And despite my dinosaur example a minute ago, I accept that this may be true. But does our morbid desire to see it outweigh the post-mortem rights and dignity of the individuals in question? In fact, do they even have any post-mortem rights? It's a big moral question, and not one that I can provide you with an answer to, but I look forward to hearing what you think about it in the comments below. The argument for educational value also faces considerable criticism from those who say that most of the bodies on display come from people who were unable to give consent for their remains to be used like this, and that it is disrespectful to the dead and to their culture and religious beliefs. The exhibits in the body world displays all come from volunteers, and the exhibition has gone through an ethical review, but this isn't always the case. Many human remains were dug up and put on display long before ethics committees were a thing. The female Egyptian mummy called Takabuti, which lies in the Ulster Museum in Belfast, was disinterred and taken from Egypt in the 19th century, and King Tut was found in the 1920s. The ancient Egyptians clearly placed a high premium on the sanctity of the body. This explains why they went to the trouble and expense of mummifying remains leaving material objects with bodies for their afterlives and sealing up their tombs to protect them. They didn't believe in having the dead on display in glass boxes like Snow White and would likely be horrified at how many of their pharaohs and other citizens have been dug up and treated. What we have here is a clash of ideologies and it doesn't just affect Egypt. In Western Christian societies, touching a dead body is not particularly taboo nor is damaging it, just think about how popular cremation is now. Interfering with a corpse in some perverted way is disgusting and completely unacceptable, but even that isn't thought to damage the person's soul or afterlife. In other cultures, past and present however, the opposite is held to be true, and the body is seen as sacrosanct. Some Native American cultures place great importance on how the corpse is treated, for instance, believing that this affects how the person's soul will travel to the afterlife. So while many of us today may not hold this belief in the importance of the human body after death, that doesn't change the fact that the ancient Egyptians and other cultures did and do, and do we not have a moral duty to respect their wishes? In the case of Charles Byrne, he reportedly stated before his death that he wanted to be buried at sea, specifically so that anatomists couldn't get a hold of his body. Although he displayed himself to earn a living during his lifetime, he didn't want to be dissected and put on show like a zoo exhibit in death. These wishes have not been respected though, and it was only in January 2023 that the Hunterian Museum officially retired his skeleton from display, though it has been kept for medical students to examine rather than being buried as many have called for. The museum defended its decision by saying, in part, that they are keeping his remains because we cannot foresee the ways in which gene and bone analysis technologies may develop that could allow greater understanding of the causes of pituitary acromegaly and giantism, which is what Charles suffered from. There are also objections to removing remains from their homelands. 
Again, the Egyptian mummy in Northern Ireland is a good example of this. Many people are more comfortable with the idea of display if it occurs in the place in which the deceased lived, but does that automatically make it better? And if so, why? For it implies that a person's body is owned by the state, even if that state didn't exist at the time they lived. Tutankhamun is in Egypt and back in his tomb in a climate-controlled glass box, and the Irish bog men seem to have lived and died in Ireland where they are now displayed. But I'll bet there are still plenty of people out there uncomfortable with both situations. Personally, I found the Dublin display to be just a bit pointless, as I didn't feel I learned anything from seeing the actual remains I observed. The knowledge I gained came from reading the information boards near the bodies, and the actual remains were a bit stomach-churning given the state they were in, but I know that others won't feel the same way. Many remains, which are no longer in their country of origin, were also seized as part of colonial activities, involving practices widely condemned today. Yet often the deceased person who landed in foreign museums and private collections in that way is still there, even centuries later, though not all are on display, so one cannot even argue that they have a widespread educational value. This has led to an increasing number of calls for them to be repatriated so that they can be buried or otherwise dealt with according to the customs of their people. Other than educational value, I believe one of the other big motivations behind showing dead bodies is for entertainment, whether the institutions who show these remains will admit to it or not. Put simply, people can be a bit ghoulish and like looking at dead bodies. Little kids are especially unlikely to be thinking about the culture and religion of Egypt or Peru or anywhere else that has produced mummies when they look at one. They're just going to say, ew, a dead person. You can see that same gravitational pull towards the macabre here on my YouTube channel. Most of the videos I do, which discuss what happened to a famous person's body after death, do well, even though I'm not showing anything gruesome. It just seems to be human nature, and I'm not saying that I'm immune to it either. It's not as though I studiously avoid museum displays, which include human remains, for instance, though I also think I'd be just fine without them. While I might have a take-it-or-leave-it attitude about this issue, though, and some qualms about how respectful and necessary the whole practice is, others have stronger views, as is their right. When the Manchester Museum covered up its unwrapped Egyptian mummies back in 2008, for example, there was a public backlash, as people wanted to be able to see the remains for themselves, and accused the museum of buying to political correctness. The institution ended up having to backtrack and partly uncover the mummies. A very telling newspaper article published in the Faulkner's Journal in 1760, after the death of Cornelius McGrath, alluded to this motivation as well, saying that his skeleton, on account of its extraordinary size, will amuse the curious and fill posterity with wonder. Likewise, the Palermo catacombs are a big tourist attraction, and as people move through corridors of skeletons, I don't think they're necessarily stopping for the educational content of the trip, whatever that may be. Displays like this rely, to one extent or another, on their quote-unquote freak show attractiveness for the average viewer. There is also a financial incentive in many cases. Entrance to museums may be free, but if visitors can be lured in by the promise of seeing a mummy, they might also spend money in the cafe or gift shop. In other cases, like Trinity College Dublin, you do have to pay to see their exhibit from the get-go, though this exhibit is mainly about the Book of Kells, actually, and other ancient Irish texts, and getting to see the skeleton of a giant was never the focus of it, and as I mentioned, it's no longer on display anyway. Then there are religious reasons. This brings us back to 2023 and to the US state of Missouri, where a nun called Sister Wilhelmina Lancaster, who passed away in 2019, was disinterred from the outdoor graveyard with the intent of reburying her inside her former monastery underneath the altar. The sisters of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles Order, had been told to expect bones, as Lancaster was not embalmed before burial and had been placed in the ground in a simple wooden coffin. Instead, they discovered she was virtually intact, with hardly any signs of decomposition. When the story got out, which seems to have been accidental, she was dubbed the Miracle in Missouri, and put on display inside the church for pilgrims to visit and even touch at first. There is also talk of fast-tracking her to sainthood. 
Her remains function as proof of her sanctity and worthiness of this honour, and so it is deemed important that they can be seen. She has also proven a great source of faith and strength to many of the Catholics who have made the journey to visit her body, providing another motive for keeping her on display. Vladimir Lenin's remains are kept for a mix of political and quasi-religious reasons. Although he apparently wanted to be buried near his mother, he is seen by many as the founding father of modern Russia, and his remains act much like a site of pilgrimage and provide a focal point for the celebration of Russian history. In this way, we might even compare it to the Lincoln Memorial in the United States, though Lincoln's body is not on display there. There is a final reason I'd like you to consider as to why human remains shouldn't be displayed, and that is that the living have an unfortunate habit of stealing bits of the dead. The very first video I ever posted on this channel, apart from a short channel trailer, was about the mystery of Skeleton Lake in the Himalayas, where hundreds of human skeletons spanning over a millennium have been found. Unfortunately, since their existence has become more widely known about, many of the bones there have been stolen by sick souvenir hunters because there was nothing to protect them. In the case of Vladimir Lenin, despite all the security around him, some pieces of his remains have also disappeared over the years, and what you see now is partly his biological remains and partly non-biological replacements to keep him looking the same. Nor do I believe for one minute that at least some of the bodies in Palermo haven't fallen victim to the same type of partial body snatching by weirdos who have some perverted obsession with keeping a part of another human being for themselves. After all, this happens even when bodies are only briefly disinterred and not put on public display. See my videos on the remains of Catherine Parr and Charles I for some examples. I hope you find this discussion of how we interact with the physical remains of the dead illuminating. Unfortunately, I know it can't be exhaustive and there will be cultures and traditions I have missed out, so please do feel free to share your knowledge of these in the comments. I invite you too to let me know there if you think dead bodies should be on public display or not, and why. And remember to vote on my community tab poll on that topic as well. For more about life after death, try my playlist on death, murder and corpses next. And until next time, keep learning.